I would like to say my book is about a diet, a massive diet we need in this nation, both fiscally and in terms of the scope and scale and purposes of government, but even more so in terms of getting this rogue, out of control central bank back into some kind of box where it is not a clear and present danger uh, to the United States. Now, I know we can talk about uh, many uh, features of that, but what I'd like to do now is suggest that even though there's 700 pages here and there's a lot of history, that really there are three big ideas in this book that I think are pretty much along the libertarian mainstream. I have been a deviant every now and then on certain issues. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I was called uh, a serial apostate <laughs> the other day by uh, some writer. So I never stay always straight and on the straight and narrow. But there are three fundamental ideas, and one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is take these ideas, fiscal rectitude, sound money, we hear that, we know, we have a feel for what those mean, free markets, and trace them through the ebb and flow of history and events and policy decisions and uh, you know, financial uh, world uh, evolution over decades and decades to try to identify those inflection points, those critical time, times when choices were made that led in the wrong direction. Because obviously today, the free market is almost dead. Today, the fiscal uh, equation amounts to a doomsday machine. I don't know how it's going to be stopped or how the national debt doesn't keep growing uh, towards 30 trillion, 115% of GDP, and I could go into some of those things as well. So we asked, what I've tried to do in the book then is to say, how did free markets get abolished? And they did for the most part. Or why in the heck did we bail out Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan, and AIG, Morgan Stanley, AIG, the auto, uh, companies and so forth, and that was done by a Republican administration. So I'm not trying to be a doom and gloom guy, but if a Republican administration does this kind of abomination, then there isn't a lot left in terms of resilience, resonance, I guess I should say, for free market policy uh, in uh, the governing process. So if sound money clearly is out the window, and everybody knows that, but let me give you one number that has really been striking to me. And that is on September 10, uh, 2008, uh, before the Lehman Brothers uh, 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 collapse occurred and then all the madness happened after that, the balance sheet of the Fed was 900 billion and it had taken the grand total of 94 years to build from zero when they opened the doors to 94 billion. And that's important, or 90 billion, because 900 billion, I'm sorry, 94 years, and that's important because remember, the balance sheet of the Fed on one side has assets, mostly government debt, bills, bonds, and so forth. On the other side has the liabilities that the Fed has created. In other words, in shorthand, the money that is cr uh, printed uh, over uh, many, many, many years. Now, if it took them 94 years to print the first 900 billion, and during that period we had some great Fed chairmen like William McChesney Martin, he's one of the heroes that I have in my book, some spectacular Fed chairman like Volcker, I really think he was great, and we had some real disasters like uh, Arthur Burns and uh, both uh, Greenspan and Bernanke. So, but still, if it took us 94 years to get there through good and bad policy, listen to this one. In the next seven weeks, Bernanke doubled that 900 billion to 1.8 trillion. He was printing money at the rate of 700 million an hour. No joking, those are the facts. You can see it on the Fed balance sheet that's uh, issued every Thursday afternoon. Now, they've got all kinds of excuses. The Wall Street was melting down. We can get into that lately. No, the bubble they had created in the first four or five years was being deflated. The debt that was being liquidated was bad debt. It never should have been there in the first place. So this was a healthy thing going on. And yet, here we are today, and this is why I think the idea of sound money is so lost. A healthy thing is happening. A purge is going on and yet we have a panic at the Fed, 
that basically ended up propping up all the assets that were way overvalued as the uh, repo debt and commercial paper market debt and unsecured debt was liquidated. The Fed came in right behind it and recreated uh, uh, the funding for this whole house of cards. Now that is about the worst performance that any central bank could make and it's led to all kinds of bad things. We can talk about the speculation and so forth. So. If we are today in a world where we have utterly unsound money, where we have a rogue bank that has basically destroyed the financial markets, remember, I think all of you would agree, the interest rate is the price in financial markets. In the money market, the overnight rate is the price of money. Uh, in the mid and longer term debt markets, the yield or the interest rate is the price of money. If we don't have a pricing mechanism in something as fluid and dynamic and giant and changing by the hour and minute as the financial system, which is the heart of capitalism, then how is the thing going to function? Well, we don't. We don't have honest interest rates. We have a Fed that pegs them that sets them, that administers them, and as a result, the whole market has become perverted, and it now trades on what the Fed is going to do next week, ne next month, on whatever smoke signal some highly paid so-called money market economists can figure out You know what the last three swing members uh, of the open market committee uh, may uh, decide to do. And therefore, the market is not discounting the future. It's not discounting risk. It's not discounting the contracts in any particular security uh, that's being valued. It's not discounting cash flow. It's discounting the Politburo, the Monetary Politburo of 12 people and which side of bed they wake up in the morning and what kind of intellectual tick uh, they have uh, this day or that. So it's all <laughs> in bad shape the fundamental things that we believe in, fiscal rectitude, sound money, free markets. The book is how it, about how it happened, the flow of history over time. And in order to make it, and I wouldn't I make it more vivid, make it more real, because you can't rewrite you know, uh, 80 years of history uh, even in 700 pages, believe me. So I have basically tried to pinpoint critical inflection points and some of the great actors who came across the stage, and I've divided them into 18 policy heroes and 18 policy villains, not because I think they were good or bad people, but at these important junctures, they made good or bad decisions. They led to the decline, to the undermining uh, and erosion of these three core ideas, uh, or they helped uh, keep them alive. Now, let's take fiscal rectitude. And here is where we get to, from the abstract to the concrete in a debate that has gone on in the conservative community. I've been involved in the budget fights, or I was for a long time. And I come out on the side of you have to balance the budget even if you think the spending is too high after you've given a good, sustained college try at, at uh, uh, starving the beast or shrinking the budget. So we have this fundamental debate that I'd like to talk about in history for a second on this idea. What is the right uh, strategic route? Starve the beast, we've heard a lot about, or pay the bills. And I come, out, uh, I come out on the side of pay the bills. The thing that came out of the Reagan era, which really was a horrible legacy, was the notion that deficits didn't matter and the rationalization that we were only trying to starve the beast and if the deficit got big enough or persistent enough or uh, extended far enough in time, surely uh, they would wake up and shrink the government. Well, it's at 24% of GDP today, 25 uh, by some counts. It was 22 when I got there way back in 1981. So uh, starving the beast hasn't worked. It has only led to a two-party competition in free lunches, the Republicans being the party of stimulating the economy, and frankly, that status, micromanaging the economy through the IRS code, uh, they became what I would call, the, what I call the 
uh, Keynesians of the prosperous classes versus the Democrats uh, using traditional Keynesian spending and uh, you know, liberal uh, interventionist approaches. So when you have two free lunch parties competing for the electorate, you end up with massive, consistent, growing, and ultimately uh, incurable national debt, and that's where we are.